Come and sing God's praises. We are standing on holy ground. Come and hear God's word. We are standing on holy ground. Come and love your neighbor. We are standing on holy ground. Come and care for God's creation. We are standing on holy ground. Come and worship the Lord. We are all standing on holy ground. Will you join me in prayer, please? Oh, holy and loving God, we've come together here this morning in this place to be with each other as we worship you, to seek a renewed sense of your presence, to pray, to sing, to learn, to enjoy being with one another. And as we pray today, we know that you understand more than we are able to say, and you hear more than we give words to. Thank you for every way you are with us, all the time, in all places. May our hearts be open this morning by our worship here. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. We sing now hymn 59 in the blue hymnal. I sing the mighty power of God. from the second chapter of Exodus, and I feel like we need a little background from chapter one. In chapter one, we hear about there's a new king in Egypt, Pharaoh, who's very threatened by the growing number of Israelites, of Hebrew people. And he's so threatened, he has all these schemes to make life very hard for them. And um, in, instead of being oppressed and going away, or become weaker, they increase and become stronger. And so he comes up with an awful plan just to make all the baby boys go away. So I am going to actually read the very, very, very last part of chapter 1 before we begin with chapter 2. But you shall let every girl live. So he's going to make the baby boys go away, but um, he's underestimated the girls. You know, so, and we will find out, we will find out some more about that in chapter 2, about how girls and women were very instrumental in the life of Moses. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. 
When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh, that's the king of Egypt, was down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister, the baby sister, said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child, nurse it for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman, the child's mother, took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. May God bless the reading of this word. strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. You are my all in Thank you, Emma and Mindy. Our second scripture reading is from uh, the book of Exodus as well, Exodus chapter 3. At this point, uh, Moses has grown up. He's living in the land of Midian. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, 
and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who were in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I've also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Our next hymn is a great uh, African-American spiritual, Go Down Moses, Let My People Go. Words are in your bulletin. We invite you to stand if you would like.
There have been a number of suggestions left in the sermon suggestion box. They're all really good suggestions, and most of them are pretty challenging. Well, among the first suggestions were three different suggestions with the same handwriting. So it looked like it was probably the same person. And uh, it probably looked like it was one of our youngest worshipers, I would say, from the handwriting. I don't know, I don't know for sure. I didn't try to investigate that too much. And, you know, people can put a name on a suggestion if you want, but certainly you don't have to do that. But one of the suggestions said a sermon about Moses. Well, okay, I could do that. But where do you start? You just choose an episode out of Moses' life, or you try to, a bigger sweep, you know, kind of the span of Moses' whole life. I mean, there's so much there. Well, then I looked at the next suggestion. It said a sermon about Nintendo. Well, okay. And the third, third suggestion, this apparently same person made, was make it fun. Well, I can try, but you know, I can't, I certainly can't, you know, no guarantees on, on that. But I thought about it and it kind of crystallized. It, it all connected. What if we thought about the span of Moses' life as though it were a video game? How many of you play video games? I mean, of any, of any kind. Well, I play Scrabble online. I know, live, living on the edge, right? I occasionally play some other games on my computer or, or on the phone, but it's been a while since I played Nintendo. But d back in the day, we had the original NES system and a couple of more um, systems since then. I think the last was the Wii. Well, if you think about something like, say, Super Mario Brothers, or, or really any kind of video game, typically there are different levels. And after you successfully completed the, the obstacles and the challenges at one level, then you move on to the next level. You, you level up. So as a way of thinking about Moses' life, what if we thought about the different eras or different stages of his life as different levels? We could look at Moses facing challenges and obstacles and overcoming them and then leveling up to the next part of his life. Now, interestingly, I looked to see if there actually was a Moses video game, and there was. It was way back in 1991. Now, it's hard to believe we've had video games for 33 years but when I stopped and thought about it, yeah, I played Pong with, at my friend Kevin's house back in the 1970s. So they've been around for a while. But to help, to help get us in the spirit of things, I want to show a clip from the Moses video game. Now, you'll, you'll notice this was a three-game package. You could either play Noah's Ark, Baby Moses, or what was the other one? Uh, David and Goliath. But we're we're going uh, to play Baby Moses. Just, just a little clip here. Now, the, the graphics are 1991 era, but it's Moses' sister Miriam who's carrying him, and she has to evade both Pharaoh's guards, and it, and it looks like spiders, okay? Wasn't technology fun back then? Yeah. <laughs> Great work, on to the next level. Well, this is a good way maybe to think about, to start thinking about Moses' life. He was born at a time when Pharaoh was very fearful of the Israelites. They were enslaved, but they'd become so numerous, they were seen as a serious threat. And so keep, to keep the Israelite population down, as well as, I'm sure, and still fear and, te and terror, a command goes out that all newborn male Israelite babies in the land should be thrown in the river. Well, in order to save his life, as Susan read for us, Moses' mother first hid him, and when she really couldn't hide him anymore, she placed him in a basket and put the basket in the reeds at the edge of the river. And Moses' sister Miriam stood at a distance from the basket to watch. Pharaoh's daughter 
came along and found the baby and took pity on this Hebrew child. Miriam asked her if she'd like her to go find the Hebrew woman to nurse the child. Moses, or Pharaoh's daughter, says yes. And so Moses' own mother is paid to nurse and care for her son until Pharaoh's daughter raises him as hers in the palace. It's hard to imagine a more heartbreaking choice that this mother had to make in an effort to save her baby and the desperation that Israelite mothers must have felt. But the plan worked. Moses survived. Moses was raised and educated in Pharaoh's household. As a grown man, Moses observed the forced labor of the Hebrews. He had enjoyed all the privileges of growing up in Pharaoh's household, but he knew that he was a Hebrew. And after seeing the brutality of, a, of an overseer badly beating a Hebrew slave, Moses was filled with rage and wound up killing the man. Eventually, Pharaoh heard of it, and Moses fled for his life. He wound up in the land of Midian. He met seven sisters who were watering their flocks. Some men tried to drive these women and their flocks away so that they could water their flocks, but Moses stood up for them. And Moses wound up marrying one of these sisters, a woman named Zipporah. Zipporah is the daughter of Jethro, a priest of Midian. Moses and Zipporah have a child. Moses settles in to life of a shepherd, away from the chaos and the struggle in Egypt. Moses seems to be doing well. He's establishing himself. Life is becoming a little bit easier. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Meanwhile, back in Egypt, Pharaoh has died, but the Hebrew people groan under slavery. They cry out to God. God hears their cries, and one day Moses is out with his flock when he sees a bush that is on fire. It continues to burn, and it is not consumed. Moses approaches the burning bush to see what is happening, and a voice calls to him, Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. The voice tells him, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God wants Moses to lead the people out of Egypt. Moses, understandably, has a little bit of trouble believing this is all happening. He says, if I go to the Israelites and say that the God of our forefathers is asking me to lead them out of Egypt, and they ask what your name is, what should I say? And God simply said, I am. And this becomes God's name, sometimes called Yahweh. Moses does not feel up to the task. I mean, would you? But God answers all of his concerns and questions and says, I will be with you. Moses says he's not much of a public speaker. And God says, that's okay, your brother Aaron can be the spokesperson. God also tells Moses that all those who wanted him dead are now gone. So Moses returns to Egypt to a new Pharaoh who is certainly not just going to allow the Israelites to leave. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Of course, Pharaoh sees this as a ridiculous request. It ain't happening. But God has a way of encouraging Pharaoh to make the right decision. And so God sends plagues, 10 plagues. The waters of the river turn to blood. There are plagues of frogs and gnats and flies, diseased livestock. People get boils on their skin. There's a plague of locusts and then darkness, perhaps an eclipse to put the fear of God into Pharaoh. And then finally, the Passover, 
where death would visit the firstborn male of each household, but would pass over homes that had lamb or goat blood sprinkled on the doorpost, as the Israelites were instructed to do. And that was enough for Pharaoh to relent. The people of Israel pack up quickly and flee. But in the wilderness, Pharaoh changes his mind. The Egyptian army comes after them. They're trapped by the Red Sea, but God acts in a powerful way to deliver the people. Once across the Red Sea, the people celebrate. <laughs> Miriam leads the people in song and dance. But the way forward is not easy. They've known nothing but slavery. It's hard to be a free people. Folks start to complain. Some said, I wish we were back in Egypt where at least we had something to eat. Moses brought the people's complaints to God, and God sent manna, bread from heaven. There would be enough each morning for that day. If they tried to store it, if they tried to save it, it would go bad. They had to trust God every day. God called Moses to the top of the mountain to give him the law for the people, the Ten Commandments, a way of living for a free people. The law was about right relationship with God and right relationship with one's neighbor, a covenant with God and a covenant with one another. But as Moses met with God on the mountain, the people were impatient. Even while he's up on the mountain, the people were already looking for other gods. Before Moses returned, the people melted down gold that they had taken from Egypt and made a golden calf to worship. Actually, I apologize for this slide. That's the very first picture I've made with artificial intelligence. I told it what to do. It, wouldn't, it refused to make a calf without horns, but what are, you gonna, what are you gonna do? The people worshiped the golden calf and God was angry, so angry with the people. He even wanted to start over with a new people. Moses begged God to forgive the people. Moses even asked God to remove Moses' name from God's book of remembrance if God would forgive the Israelites. And so Moses interceded for the people and God did not act against them. The Bible says that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one would speak to a friend. Moses continued to care for the people, even when they disobeyed God. The pattern of turning from God and failing to trust in God continued. Moses sent scouts to go and check out the land of Canaan, the promised land that God had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob so long ago. The scouts or, or spies returned. Most of them said that the inhabitants of the land were too powerful, that entering the promised land was just a dream. Only two came back with a report that with God leading them, the land would be theirs. It was Caleb and Joshua. The people were furious with them. When Moses wanted to proceed to the land of Canaan, the people revolted. And so the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Among the adults of the nation of Israel, only Caleb and Joshua would live long enough to actually enter the promised land. Joshua became Moses' assistant and successor in waiting. 
God led Moses to Mount Nebo. Moses went up onto the mountain, and God showed him the land that God had promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Moses would not enter the promised land himself, but he was able to see the land they had long dreamed of. Moses died there on the mountain. Joshua would eventually lead the people across the Jordan River into the promised land. The book of Deuteronomy concludes, never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants in the entire land. And for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Moses is the greatest hero of the Hebrew people, but he was far from perfect. I mean, he killed a man and ran for his life. He had his moments of disobedience, his moments he wasn't so proud of. Yet God used Moses in a powerful way. And maybe what's most helpful for us to think about is that Moses walked with God. The Bible says God knew Moses face to face. We don't have to be a Moses to talk to God. We don't have to perform signs and wonders and miracles to spend time with God. We can all pray, we can all read, we can all meditate, we can all offer praise and worship, and we can all choose to follow God's ways. We can choose to follow Jesus. We can all choose to do the right thing. Moses had this deep and personal relationship with God, and he cared deeply for the people. And it kind of works that way. Loving God leads us to loving and caring for others. I want to thank you to whoever suggested Moses, and I want to thank you to whoever suggested Nintendo. Let's pray together. God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Moses and Miriam, God of all those who've gone before us, and God of all nations, in the afterglow of Independence Day, we give thanks for our country and for all the blessings of this great land. And as we gather in worship this morning, we give thanks for those who went before us and who made our freedoms possible. We think especially of early Baptists and others who fought for the separation of church and state in a nation where all could worship freely with the state neither supporting nor hindering the religious faith and practice of anyone. We give thanks for the sacrifice and generosity of all who have made our freedom possible. We pray even now for those who are serving our country in many ways. As we celebrate the blessings of our nation, grant us to know that we love our country best when we love you first. As we celebrate our freedom, help us to remember that the freedom which endures is the freedom to serve you, the freedom to love you and love our neighbor, the freedom to act for the good of all. As we celebrate our patriotism, stir within us a deeper loyalty to your kingdom. We know, dear God, that the greatness of a nation is measured by whether its people do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with you. For the ways in which we have been blind to injustice, blind to need, blind to those who need to know your love and your grace, forgive us, Lord. Open our eyes and lead us to faithful action. We remember before you those concerns that have been shared this morning. 
we lift up before you both concerns spoken and unspoken. We pray for your strength and healing and wisdom and grace. We especially pray for Stephanie as she recovers from her surgery. We pray for safe travels for all who will go to Green Lake and pray that would be a time of learning and refreshment and worship. All of this we lift up before you. We pray in the name of the one who is our true source of freedom, even Jesus Christ. Amen. In a moment, we'll join together in the Lord's Supper. Uh, before we do that, we sing the hymn, Walk With Me. It's found in your black hymnal, number 2242. Again, we invite you to, to stand if you wish. When the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, God sent them bread from heaven, manna to sustain them each day. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We gather this morning at the Lord's table to celebrate God's grace and goodness in sending Jesus. And we remember Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf as we take the bread and the cup we recall again God's great love shown us in Jesus. This is the Lord's table and all are welcome here. We invite you to share this meal, not because you must, but because you may, not because you are strong, but because you are weak, not because of anything you have done, but because of what God and Jesus Christ has done for you. 
Let's pray together. Oh God, we come to your table this morning with joy and gratitude as we remember Jesus' love for us, as we partake the bread, as we partake the cup, symbols of that love and sacrifice, we pray it might be for us spiritual food, that you might lead us as we go forth to be your people in this world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. the bread of life. After the supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he poured it, and said, This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing. For our benediction, we'll uh, make a circle or, or a good horseshoe around the sanctuary and sing, Blessed be the tie that binds.